How's everybody doing? How you all doing? Isn't she cool? I, I sometimes bring her along, but there was a, a very special reason why I brought her today. I'll, I'll explain that as I go along. Well, I'm glad Rose spoke the truth. I never know what she's going to say when she gets up. You know, and um, every time I hear someone share their Al-Anon story, I'm, I'm just so moved and impressed and... You know, I have such love and high regard for Al-Anon. But I guess I'm prejudiced about us in AA because, um, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous, the doors open, you come in, you know, the only requirement for membership is the desire to stop drinking. If, if you want to be a member of Al-Anon, you have to know somebody. <laughs> Now, if you didn't get that, you could talk to your sponsor. <laughs> well, first things first, I would like to thank Ellen for making a call to our office to invite us to this holy place. And what makes this place holy is the people who come and spend time here. So this place will be in better shape because of your beautiful presence here today. I truly believe that. When Ellen called and invited us and, you know, what we might do. And, of course, our big problem was when could we do it. And, uh, you know, picnic came up and uh, a Sunday afternoon because we work on the weekends and, you know, could we get here from there and, and whatever. And um, it, it's just amazing how, how things work out. So it is an honor and a privilege to be in, in this holy place. And my prayer is going to be that the marvelous and wonderful message that's being given out here in this holy place will continue to be given out a day at a time. And I thank the staff and the supporters of this holy place for all the service and, and work that they've done to get this place in operation and to keep it going uh, a day at a time. Uh, we had an interesting trip. We came from uh, Willimantic, Connecticut today, and it was very interesting. Uh, we stopped at a few rest areas, and we met um, the leaf peepers. <laughs> you know, just the other day, I was in Vermont, and a beautiful friend of ours, she was explaining about leaf peepers. And I said to her, well, I've heard of snowbirds, but I never heard of a leaf peeper. And then when we were uh, coming up to Vermont, before we learned about leaf peepers, uh, we had stopped and we met some folks and, you know, they were going to see the leaves and, you know, whatever, crowds of them. And so uh, we were telling her, and she said, oh, the leaf peepers. So I, I've used that expression a lot the past couple of days. Uh, as, as some of you know, I collect 
you know, lines and words and thoughts and, you know, so I find leaf peeper interesting. <laughs> so I'm telling you, the people here in New England, I'm telling you, get ready because you should have seen them. <laughs> They are coming up here to you, bag and baggage. <laughs> so get ready for those leaf peepers. <laughs> of course, I'm, I'm uh, not presently a leaf peeper. And people don't come to my area as a leaf peeper. Uh, I come from the Bronx. <laughs> You may have heard of it, it's part of New York City. And the people who come from the Bronx do not have an accent. <laughs> and the other thing about the Bronx is that there are only two places in the world that have the in front of them. One is the Bronx and the other is the Vatican. <laughs> And I'm associated with both of those places. Uh, in our travels recently, we were in a hotel lobby and I was waiting for Rose. She was in the restroom and I'm standing outside this bar and restaurant. And I saw a sign a big sign and it said, we no longer serve women at the bar. And that was followed with, you have to bring your own. And this was a big hotel. We went down to the other end of the hotel and there was another bar and restaurant. And the sign out there said, if you're drinking to forget, please pay in advance. <laughs> Aren't they profound? <laughs> I, I thought they were just great. I would like to thank each of you for coming to be with me on this, the most important day of my life. It's not my birthday. It's not the anniversary of anything in particular. It's just simply the only day I have. And when people come to be with you at such a significant time in your life, you try to remember them. At least I do. And I'll try to remember you because you're here with me on this, the most important day of my life. However, today happens to be, and that's why I brought my, my little nun doll, today, the 22nd of September, is the feast, I'm sure many of you know this, it's the feast of St. Maurice. <laughs> so this was my feast day. So uh, in my home and in my community, they're having big celebrations for me, and here I am with you. <laughs> But I'm celebrating. So today is the feast day of, of St. Maurice uh, and companions. Uh, I wasn't Maurice as a little kid growing up. Sometimes people say, was your name like Maurice as a little kid? I say, no. But when I was entering the convent, in those days, you had to take a saint's name. So I said to my father, I have to get a saint's name. He said, well, see if they give you mine. <laughs> so I submitted my father's name. He was Maurice. And uh, that's my uh, name that I have as a sister. I could go back to my original name, but that's another long story. I won't tell it to you this trip. <laughs> if you don't remember anything I share this evening, Please remember this because this is how I want to be remembered. It's the most important thing about me at any point on the clock. 
I'm an alcoholic, which means one brandy, two brandies, three brandies, floor. <laughs> I'm also a woman. I'm a member of a religious community. I'm an RN, a real nun. <laughs> I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous in good standing, in particular the Forest Hills group in Queens, New York. That's my home group. And the last thing I always tell you about myself is my name. Incidentally, my name is Sister Maurice. One of the things that I'm partial to in our, in our fellowship is that it's a fellowship of equals. There are no titles in Alcoholics Anonymous. No one really cares what you do for a living. I love that expression, fellowship of equals. I don't think there's another outfit in society that can claim fellowship of equals like we can. At least we'd match any other group that's out there. So there are no titles, yet you have never been anything else in this fellowship other than Sister Maurice. Now isn't that a title? Well, I see it as my name. It's on all my important papers. It's on my driver's license. It's the name I've been using most of my life. It's also written up quite well, two police stations, City of New York. <laughs> But moreover, it's the name that I gave to you when I came into your beautiful presence a while back now. A call had been made for me and I was to go to this Forest Hills group of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I really wasn't quite sure that someone of my class and caliber should be going to such a place as AA. So I was not a happy camper when I came. Little by slowly, thanks to you, that all changed for me. So much so that I can say quite comfortably today, I choose to live the AA way of life. For a few years I said, I have to go to AA, I better go to AA, I gotta go to AA. But you know what? I don't have to, better, or gotta. I choose to live the AA way of life. And when I talk about something being a way of life, it's not an incidental experience. It's not something I do when the spirit moves me. A way of life to me is as much a part of me as my right hand and my left hand, and that's the way I see Alcoholics Anonymous today. But for starters, I went to this first meeting. I went up the stairs, down the stairs, into a little room. There was just one man in the room. He took a look at me, came running across the room, grabbed my hand, told me who he was, and he said, what's your name? I said, me? He said, yeah, what's your name? Oh, I said, I'm Sister Maurice. Now this man didn't say to me, your mother doesn't call you that, does she? <laughs> and he didn't say to me, well, we'll have a group conscience meeting and I'll get back to you. <laughs> the very next thing the man said was, hi, Sister Maurice, you're welcome. And in my over 31 years with you a day at a time, no one has even suggested that I call myself anything else. So I've never been anything else in our fellowship other than Sister Maurice. The name is important, it's mine. But the most important thing about me at any point on the clock is what I told you first and foremost, I'm an alcoholic. And each and every time I say that, beginning first, when I awaken in the morning, I don't know how you sleep, uh, of course I don't. <laughs> But I sleep primarily on my right side. And when I awaken in the morning, I don't even know I have two eyes, because this one is buried in the pillow. Before I go looking for this eye, the very first thing I do, I announce before my God, I am an alcoholic. It puts me on the right wavelength. It sets the tone for me here. And any time thereafter that I say I'm an alcoholic, I am reminded that of all the things I do each day that God gives me, my most important job, work, task, assignment is that I stay sober. And I do that best through the principles and traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous as they have been written. When I came a while back, you gave me a book. 
and you called it big. I thought it was an interesting way you described the book. The gal who gave it to me, she was much shorter than I was, and she held this book in two hands, and she said to me, here is a big book. No coincidence, there were some fellows putting some shiny signs on the wall, and my eye hit upon the one that said, keep it simple. And as sick and all as I was, I was able to make a connection. And I said to myself, wouldn't dare say it to the lady, but I said to myself, boy, do these people practice what they preach? Because you can't get much simpler than that. Here is a big book. Of course, now we have the paperback which I call the small, big book. And I do that purposely. I don't just call it the small book, because there's another book in the bookstores in the mall called the small book. And it talks about being an alternative to Alcoholics Anonymous. So I call ours the small, big book. Well, you know, you introduce anything new in AA or Al-Anon, and they send for you. <laughs> this fellow came to me one night. He had a small, big book. He's pacing up and down, and he's saying, hey, sister, you call this the small, big book. I said, I do. He said, that's a contradiction. I said, what do you mean, contradiction? He said, small, big, small, big. <laughs> I thought for a moment and I said, well, we have had jumbo shrimp for years. <laughs> I, can, I can see that some of you didn't get that, but I, I'm, sh <laughs> I'm, I'm sure your sponsor will know. Well, I took the book from you, the one that you called big, and this is what you said to me. You told me I should read the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I should study the big book. I should believe what I found there. I should share what I believe, and I should practice what I share. And then you said we suggest that you do that along with the people who know how to do it best and you call that outfit the fellowship. And then you put that whole thing together and you said to me, that is a design for living that really works. Oh, what did I know about anything? I said, let me see what I can do. <laughs> and that design for living has worked so well for this lady here that I don't spend a fleeting moment of my precious time looking around for alternative ways to go. I need all the help I can get, believe you me. But it is always as a secondary measure to Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcohol became a way of life for me in a very short period of time. It dictated my moods, it made my decisions, it said you will and it said you won't. I found it very hard to eventually surrender to the fact that whenever the first drink See, I thought maybe it was the 21st. But whenever the first drink of alcohol went into this body, mind, and spirit, two things happened. One, I didn't know how many more I was going to have. And two, I didn't know what my behavior was going to be like. However, in those days, if you met me along the way and you said, sister, could I ask you a question? Sure, ask me anything. Who or what is the center of your life? I would have been insulted by the question. You just called me sister. You see how I'm dressed, every piece from stem to stern. You just saw me come out of that building called convent. And you're asking me, who's the center of my life? How come you don't know that the center of my life is gone? So whenever the first drink of alcohol went into this body, mind, and spirit, two things happened. I didn't know how many more I was going to have or what my behavior was going to be like. However, in those days, if you said to me, sister, how many did you have or will you have? I would have said two, 
because that's what a lady should have. <laughs> and if you said to me, what was your behavior like or what will it be like? I would have said steady as you go because that's how I saw myself. I was a first grade teacher at the time and I had the reputation in those days of being the best teacher in the school. When the children came to first grade after Labor Day each year, by the end of September, my kids were ready for college. <laughs> so at 10 o'clock in the morning, I'd be working very hard with these kids, and something would start in my body, mind, and spirit. And it would be screaming in there, you need a drink. And the very next thing I would do, morning after morning, would be to put up against the screaming what people told me I had so much of, and that was willpower. And the willpower approach was futile. And I went on to learn, and I'm glad I did, that it wasn't that I was a weak-willed individual, but rather I was a diseased person. I was a sick, untreated alcoholic. And when you're in that condition, it goes beyond the strength of your will to do other than to satisfy what's going on in there. So I'd move to the next phase of my game plan, and I'd say, well, these kids can go out to the bathroom, then they can have their snack, I'll get the teacher next door to keep an eye on them, because I'm a responsible teacher, and then I'll go over to the convent, get a drink, and be back when this is all over. And I'd be running across the yard to the convent, morning after morning, and this would be my thinking. This is gonna be my last drink, at least until I've done my day's work. Uh, I was too sick to recall in those days that at 5 a.m., when the big bell went off to get us into our day, my story goes back to old God's time before we went mod, and we had this big bell that went off at 5 a.m., and for me to get into anything in those days, I had to reach over from my bed and take that drink, and I hated doing that. And each and every time I took it, I would say, this is gonna be my last drink, at least until I've done my day's work. I might say too, because maybe someone needs to hear it. It was not one of my goals in life to become an alcoholic. I do not recall getting up a dark and gloomy day, a bright and sunny day, and saying, today's the day. Alky, by six tonight, watch me. <laughs> I'll destroy me and see how many I can take with me. <laughs> I do not see alcoholism as self-inflicted. I believe it is a sickness that comes to a person. I think it's a marvelous and wonderful idea that we have steps that suggest to us that in God's time, we make amends because we are accountable. But I don't hold myself responsible for the sickness that came to me. However, I hold myself very, very, very responsible for the precious life-giving gift of sobriety that has been given to me. I did not get sober. I tried to get sober, and I couldn't pull it off. I don't believe a person can get sober. That's my opinion. I believe something bigger, greater, outside of the person takes place. They call it a miracle. And I believe the precious life-giving gift of sobriety is given. And I believe it's given by one bigger, greater than all of us put together. I choose to call that one God. So I feel very responsible to take care of the precious life-giving gift of sobriety that God has given me. So much so that I have no problem in sharing with you. If you should ever hear that Maurice is back drinking, please, please, don't call me a victim. Call me a volunteer. And the very next thing you should say about me, somewhere along the line, she wasn't willing to do everything necessary to stay sober. I cannot plead ignorance today. You have taught me and taught me well how to take care of the precious life-giving gift of sobriety each day that God gives me. Going back to the scene in the bed with the eye in the pillow, the second thing I do, before I get out of the bed, I pray the Lord's Prayer. And when I reach the part of the prayer that says, give us this day our daily bread, I emphasize the word daily, because I want to remind myself that I will have sufficient bread for today. 
He will not refuse anyone who asks for the bread, but he only gives it to us a day at a time. I do not have tomorrow's bread. There are advantages to years of sobriety. I've had them. But as the years of sobriety increase, so do the perils of smugness. Complacency is a killer. You know, the little sheep that strays from the flock. Maybe you know some little sheep. You know the little sheep who says, oh, don't worry about me. I know you haven't seen me at meetings, but God is good. Sobriety is wonderful. I'm in a new relationship. I'm working very hard in my field, but don't be worrying about me. The little sheep that strays from the flock is usually the one that's found in the ditch over the embankment and hanging from the barbed wire fence. A favorite fruit of mine is a banana. And every time I eat a banana, I have a meditation. And the meditation is, the banana that leaves the bunch is the one that gets skinned. <laughs> I have a drunk a lot that tells you quite well. All by myself, I can stay very sick and quite drunk. But I truly believe I cannot stay sober and fairly well without you. I was affected physically, mentally, spiritually, socially, emotionally. Physically, I fared out pretty well. There were times I tried to arrange my own physical death. I used to take the car, leave the Bronx, go across the George Washington Bridge, up into Jersey, and I'd pull over where you could sightsee, and I would say, when those cars are gone, when those folks are gone, I'm gonna run this car over the embankment because I don't know what's the matter with me. And then I'd have what I call today a moment of amazing grace. And I'd say, I'll go get a drink and I'll come back and do this another time. Tar is not to die physically, but there are other ways of dying I'm sure you can identify. I suffered the death of my values. I suffered the death of my integrity. I suffered the death of everything I stood for as a woman, everything I stood for as a sister. All those areas of my life died. Outwardly, I looked pretty good, held a job, did it fairly well, tried to keep up with my responsibilities. And above all during this time, above all, I always said my prayers. No matter what shape I was in, I was always praying away. And some of you have shared with me that you thought you missed the boat because you didn't pray enough. Listen, I prayed enough for you and all belonging to you. <laughs> so this disease of alcoholism must be so big, and indeed it is, that something as powerful as prayer will not take it away. I don't believe you can just pray your way through alcoholism. And yet we say, where would we be without prayer? Prayer is a path where there is none. But for folks like you and me, I think there's another piece that goes with the prayer. I describe it in this way. Pray and row the boat. And this beautiful design for living, this program of Alcoholics Anonymous, enables us to do that, to pray and to row the boat. I denied that alcohol was my problem. I was somewhat relieved when I learned that denial is the major presenting symptom of alcoholism. And when you're in denial with this disease, you are not in touch with reality. What I knew about my situation would fit on a postage stamp. What was happening in my life was as big as the state of New Hampshire. But if I didn't have it up here when it happened, when it was presented to me, then it didn't happen. Because if it did happen, I'd have it up here. Now, sometimes somebody says, well, you know, not too many people talk to me about my drinking. Oh, I had hundreds of people talk to me. Some of them wanted to be martyrs at an early age. The nerve of that one coming in here and talking to me about my drinking. There were many times that I exercised that denial. My mother was in the hospital having a total hip operation. I went every day to be at my mother's bedside because that's where a good daughter should be. She was there a long time. The operation wasn't as perfected then as it is today. 
And one day my beautiful mother said to me, if you don't come tomorrow, it'll be just fine. You must have a lot of work to do around the convent and the school. Why don't you skip a few days? And my thinking was, wow, there she is with all her pain and she's thinking of me. But I know today, because I'm in touch with reality, that my beautiful mother couldn't bring herself to say, you're an embarrassment to me. You're no help to me. I don't need you around this hospital drunk. Now I have one sister, and she's also a sister, and during my act of alcoholism, my sister secretly wished she had joined a missionary community and lived in Mexico. It's very hard to be proud of a sick, untreated alcoholic. I, I know that today, I didn't know it then. My sister came to the hospital to visit my mother. She gave me one of those come outside the door kind of winks. I dutifully went outside. My sister is very tall. She towers over me. She put her finger like this. She's very soft spoken, like my mother. And she put her finger like this and she said, why? Why would you come to this hospital at four o'clock in the afternoon drinking? Well, I was just about to give a lecture when it dawned on me, we've been down this road a hundred times before. To the best of my recollection, not a word did I speak. But being a typical alcoholic, and that's all that I am, couldn't let well enough alone. <laughs> so I took my right hand, which was the more powerful of my two, and I belted her. <laughs> Shortly thereafter, two nurses came running down the hall and they are yelling, sisters, sisters. <laughs> Uh, they were not calling us sisters because we were the duty girls. But we were dressed like sisters used to dress, some still dress today. My veil was on the floor, hers was someplace else. Now this is the famous hospital for special surgery in New York City. People come from all over the world to this hospital. And I learned a couple of years later that one of the major rules of this hospital is that no patient leaves their room unescorted. They were coming out, crutches, wheelchairs, all fours. Of course, the word got around quickly, there were two nuns out there killing one another. Now, in the midst of this chaos, I have a couple of thoughts. Interesting enough, maybe you'll identify. I did not have the thought, maybe I shouldn't have belted her. I did not have the thought, maybe I shouldn't have had the last drink before I came down here. My major thought as I'm staring at my sister is, why did she scream? <laughs> you know, I look back today with a sober, clear head. Do you know it's perfectly normal? You belt someone, they let out a hoop. <laughs> My other concern, my purse had fallen onto the floor, making a rather loud sound as it fell to the floor. I was a little distracted with the purse. I wasn't too concerned about the few dollars in the purse. I have a vow of poverty. I kept it quite well during this time. But I was very concerned about the pint of holy water in the purse. One pint of Christian Brothers brandy. And what is the thinking of a sick, untreated alcoholic? No one leaves here with that purse other than you know who. Now there's only one word to describe someone who'd be in that position. And I had to go through a lot of other descriptions. And if there's anyone in this gathering who still sees themselves in this first grouping, I would suggest that you leave that thinking here this evening because it doesn't apply. I had to go through bad, hopeless, weak-willed, sinner, you should know better. But the way I would describe someone today would be sick, unwell, not playing with full deck, that's respectful. <laughs> or I heard a fellow one night at a meeting, he said he was a quart low. <laughs> I heard another fellow another night, he said he had a photogenic mind, he just never had any film in the camera. <laughs> well, I had to go away and have lots of help from you before I could see myself as sick and unwell. If you drink and you drive, you might miss the mark. 
I was always behind the wheel of a car. It was an insult to show on your face that you would drive us home. I brought you there, I bring you home. My first accident, July of 70. Sister Rose was in court over the dismissal of a teacher from her school. There was a big to-do in the Archdiocese of New York about the dismissal of this teacher. She had a very prominent lawyer appointed by the diocese, and I said, I'll be in court to help the lawyer help Rose. <laughs> Now, how do we affect the people on the other side of the coin? The night before the trial, Rose called me up and she said, Maurice, please, don't come to court. <laughs> and my thinking was, wow, there she is with all her pain, and she's thinking of me. <laughs> well, I know today she was thinking of herself, and rightly so. It was not my style to push. I said, you know what? You'll have a lot of paperwork to do. I'll go to my classes. I'll meet you downtown at lunchtime. You can brief me, and I'll advise you for the afternoon session. And to be rid of me, she said, fine. Well, I was in graduate school that summer, and I drove well fortified from the top of my city, which would be the top of the Bronx, to the bottom of my city, the Wall, Wall Street section of my city. It was five minutes after 12 lunchtime, a working day in Wall Street and the weather was clear. Those are the things they tell you at the top of the police report. <laughs> a United States mail truck that was parked by the curb minding its own business got in my way. <laughs> and I smashed into it. And when the policeman came on the driver's side, first word out of his mouth, you couldn't miss it, he said sister. Now I was a little taken back by the next part. He didn't say sister, are you hurt? Could I call someone? Do you think women will ever be ordained? <laughs> he said, sister, could you have been drinking? And for a fleeting moment, I wondered how this guy got on the police force. As was my style. Officer, could I help you? So I proceeded to tell the officer about my friend who was in court being persecuted, how upset I was, etc., etc. Well, I went into a blackout, eventually a pass out. I woke up in a convent a short distance away. I woke up in a strange bed, half my clothes on, half my clothes off. I'm looking around saying, where am I? How did I get here? What happened? It was not my custom then, certainly not my custom today, <laughs> to wake up in strange beds. <laughs> Well, I'm around long enough to know that you have your story, but um, <laughs> I always woke up in my own bed. <laughs> but at a time like that, we all have the same tricks of the trade. Where am I, what happened, and how do you get out of here? I put that game plan into operation. I could hear some talking through a partially open door. So I tiptoed over. I was glad the door was open a little bit, so I didn't have to squeak it. Of course, as many of you know, our style, you know, we don't go over and throw the door open and say, what happened? <laughs> so you go over quietly and you put an eye and an ear out and you try to pick up a little something because you know from previous experiences they will be questioning you and you know from nothing. <laughs> Oh, nothing stupid about an algae. <laughs> so I peek out and I could see Rose. And I knew as long as Rose was there, everything was going to be in great shape. Now the other sister, she was about seven feet tall. <laughs> and she was like a lunatic. She was yelling and screaming at Rose. And I got to the door as the big tall lady was screaming at Rose, your friend is on pills or she's drinking. And in order to help her, you are going to have to hurt her. I thought that was poor advice. <laughs> so I took my ear and my eye in, and I went back to bed to get a little rest to handle Rose, who came in and asked the going question in our lives at that time. What happened? I told it as I saw it. I lost control of the car because I was so upset about the court case. Well, in those days, the car was in my mother's name. 
My mother didn't know anything about the accident. I had the car fixed, back out on the road, three weeks had passed. Every time you talk to Rose, she had this question, when are we gonna tell your mother about the accident? Never. <laughs> Why do you wanna tell my mother? Well, the car's in her name. So what, the car's fixed. <laughs> then the fears that set in for a sick, untreated alcoholic. What if Rose tells your mother? <laughs> So I called Rose up, invited her out for supper, my treat, took her to a little restaurant, leaned across the table in the restaurant and said, if you dare to tell my mother about the accident, someday you will come out of your convent. I'll be sitting in a car, and when you cross the street, that will be it. <laughs> that is called threatening someone's life. Now, I always share that in my story, and one night, a hundred years ago now, that means a long time, I was speaking someplace, and we had a friend at the meeting. She's not in program, but she came to hear me speak. And at the end, there was a little commotion, because she was pushing everybody aside, and she's saying, I, this can't wait, I have to get up there. So I was kind of watching, and I feel myself getting red, and I'm saying, you know, she got up to me, and I said, what's the matter with you? She said, do you really think you would have run over Rose. <laughs> Do you know up until that moment, no one had ever asked me that question before? Not even Rose. <laughs> I thought for a moment and I said, of myself, no. I wouldn't hurt a fly. As a little kid, little tot, teenager, young adult, in the convent, 100 years, that means a long time, you never knew I was around. I was like part of the woodwork, part of the drapes. What did I have to offer? You know, life comes from the inside out. That life is given by God and no one is deprived of it, I believe. But because of our history and our story, we don't get in touch with all that God has given. So I saw myself as a nothing. I was always hiding out. But you know, you put one drink in here the first one. And you can paint the most tragic scene you can think of. And I could be the one heading it up. And I always like to point out, because sometimes people think, well, it might be different because you're a sister. I always like to point out, it wasn't that I was at mass the next morning, or that I was reading one of my 10,000 religious books that I had in those days. And the thought came to me, oh, you shouldn't kill Rose. That isn't what happened. You know what happened? It was another moment of that amazing grace. It just wasn't to be part of my story or part of Rose's. And the other thing I want to say, with 31 years of continuous sobriety, thank you, God, you put one drink in here, the first one and you can paint the most tragic scene you can think of, and I could be the one heading it up. Well, the disease was moving along, and one day I got a call from my boss. Now, in those days, if you got this kind of a call, it was in the same category as the Pope called you up and said, get yourself to Rome. You never heard from the big boss in those days. There would only be two reasons that you might hear from her. One, you were in trouble, or there was a special assignment that only you could do. So I'm driving up to see the boss, and this is my thinking. I have enough to do. <laughs> Why don't they ask somebody else? So we get there, we have a little chit chat. She says, Maurice, I'll get to the point. Some of the sisters are saying that you drink too much. Now in those days, you wouldn't dare ask a question of the big boss. I asked a question. I studied when I asked it, but I asked her. I said, well, where are they? And I guess, because no one ever asked her a question in her position, she got a little nervous and she said, oh, she said, they don't want to be mentioned. And I said to myself, they feared for their lives. <laughs> and you know, in a very sick and negative way, I wouldn't recommend this to anyone. I was into one of our steps at that moment. Made a list.
of all people who had harmed me and asked God to be rid of them. And I sat there writing one contract after another. Well, I asked her another question. I said, do you really know anything about me? Because in those days, there was a gap between the big boss and the rest of us. She said, well, I have a file. She went over, she peeked in, and she said, oh, I didn't know you were doing this in the diocese, and oh, you're gonna get your master's degree. And she closed the file and she said, you know, Maurice, I will never ever again believe this about any of our sisters. And I said, that's a good policy to follow. <laughs> She gave me an apology and off I went. And I walked back to the car and I just had one thought. She will never, ever, ever send for me again. She never did. Next time she arrived unannounced and put me away. <laughs> so when I learned about denial with this disease and not being in touch with reality, it helped me immensely. I was angry and resentful during this time, angry with God. I had given my life to God, what, what do you want? I love the word relationship. You've been my teachers about relationships. Prior to recovery, I started this game plan as a little tot, trying to relate to God, whoever or whatever he was. And I continued the same game plan all the way into the convent many years later. I sat up straight, I knelt up straight, I disciplined myself. And you know, we didn't have the expression in those days, but you know the expression that would have applied? Been there, done that. And then when I was drinking, it was taking God on. If you don't need me, well, I don't need you. Now, if I don't need someone bigger, greater, outside of this lady here, I wonder who I think I am. So I was angry and resentful with God. I was depressed during this time. I was in the convent many years before I picked up alcohol. Didn't like the taste of alcohol, didn't use alcohol. On the 5th of January, 1967, my beautiful father, Maurice, he went to God. And upon his death, when he looked eyeball to eyeball into the eyes of God, at that moment, I believe is perfection for anyone. And I believe whatever you lack, you will receive at that moment. And that's how my father received sobriety. Because he died of alcoholism at the age of 58. And I buried my father and I went way inside. And I came out with a drink in my hand. And I can say quite comfortably today that my father and myself were carbon copies of one another with one big difference. The way we were to receive the precious life-giving gift of sobriety. So I was using alcohol to lift me out of a depression and I was getting more depressed. I had my prayer beads, my rosary beads, I'm praying away, hanging on to the sheets with the other hand and I'm no sooner in the bed when I have to get up and get a drink. And I said to God, you know what God, I don't want to drink anymore tonight, please help me. I'll do more work for you and for your people Please don't let me drink tonight. We'll see the first drink of the day always has the final say. And of course we had had that. So the covers get pushed back, the rosary beads go to the floor, you get up out of the bed, I crawl along in the dark to find my hiding spot where my bottle was, and I did something I didn't want to do. I took another drink. And after I took that drink that night, I beat that floor, and I doubted the existence of God. How could a God who loved me, a God that I was to relate to, how could he allow me to be in that condition? I'll bet there's no God. I live in downtown Manhattan, right in the heart of New York City. And when I'm in town, I drive on the FDR Drive, the East River Drive, and I see our brothers and sisters, yours and mine, they're on both sides of the highway there. They build their homes there, out of cardboard boxes and crates. And you see them frying an egg. And they need a jacket, a pair of shoes, both male and female, our brothers and sisters. And you know, they have little brown bags. I only had one kind of brown bag. They have my kind and other kinds. 
And you know, if those folks, if they went over to the guardrail on the highway and they beat the guardrail and they doubted the existence of God, we'd say, poor socks, what they got going for them. I'm in a beautiful convent. I want for nothing. And alcohol brought me to the point where I doubted the existence of God. As we say in here, whether you come from Yale or jail, Park Avenue, Park Bench, what does it matter where you came from? I think it's very important to get to know your history, your story. But I put more energy into where do we go from here? Whatever happened this morning, yesterday, a week ago, a year ago, or a hundred years ago, you have taught me to learn from the experience and not to let it stand in the way of being that person that God created you to be. And the other thing I did that night, I cried out at the top of my lungs. Isn't there anybody anywhere who knows what I'm going through? Because each one in the throes of the sickness thinks nobody, nobody knows what I'm going through. Well, I didn't know you were up the street and around the corner and down the road and over the mountain going through the same thing. But I'm mighty glad that somewhere along the journey, God saw fit that we would find one another in this beautiful fellowship. And I believe it is God who has arranged our meeting. C.S. Lewis says in one of his writings about relationships, he says it's as if God says to the people in the relationship, you have not chosen one another, but I, God, have chosen you for one another. If you think of the relationships that you have in the fellowship, would you of yourself have chosen those people? Maybe yes, maybe no. I like to think it was arranged, like happened at the gatehouse in Akron, Ohio, with Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob. And as a result of that arranged relationship, here we are this evening. Well, today I make bargains, deals, promises, commitments, and I follow through. I attribute that to one fact and one fact only. I don't drink alcohol while I'm sober. Very significant in Maurice's life. <laughs> and the final stage is acceptance. The disease was progressing rapidly, and finally it all came to a head because I had two exceptional do-gooders in my life, my sister and Rose. And keeping it very simple, they snitched. <laughs> they blew the whistle and turned me into the boss that I had charmed a few months before. They brought the boss to my mother's where I was hiding out. I noticed a marked difference in the boss. <laughs> she wasn't interested in anything I had to say. She spoke past tense. And she said things like, arrangements have been made. And they're expecting you in Lutheran General Hospital in Park Ridge, Illinois. I listened. She said you could go Friday or Saturday. I listened. Then she said you'll be there for 28 days. And I said to myself, I won't be there for 28 minutes. And then she said, there you will find out what is wrong with you. And I said, there isn't anything wrong with me. I said to myself, but you know, there's nothing stupid about an alcoholic. I knew the only way I was going to get out of this room and away from these three people was to say, I'd go. Well, I said, I'll go. I'll go Saturday. So I went out on an AA plane, American Airlines, <laughs> the way I like to go. And there I met some folks like you. There were 64 patients, male and female, and the word got around very quickly that we had this Catholic sister in treatment. And one by one you came to me, you beat up on yourself, you said terrible things about yourself, but you always finished by saying, you know, sister, this is a mistake for you. You shouldn't be here. You're not like me. Well, do you know, anyone who thinks like I do is gonna be my friend. I scrapped my getaway plan, and I said, maybe I can help these people. And do you know, by the end of the first week, I was a therapist? 
And the word got around quickly. You don't like your counselor, you're not getting it in group, you talk to that sister. She knows everything about everything. Now every day at one o'clock, we had what they call free time. Well, in those days, free time, and then in parentheses, this is what you'll do with it. <laughs> we were to stay in our rooms, read, write, listen to tapes. I always did as I was told, since I was this high. Right into the convent. Somebody said jump, I jumped. Somebody said stop jumping, I stopped jumping. I talk about compartments. There's a compartment in here called power of choice. It was given to us by God. No one has been deprived of it. But you know what? Because of our history and our story, we don't get to get in touch with our compartments. But I'm telling you, if you're faithful to this design for living, you get in touch with all that God has given you. I truly believe that. So, one o'clock every day, there you will find me. I have a nice table, tape recorder, pens, books. I'm doing my assignments. I'd be there two minutes each day, and I'd take the whole table, I'd throw it clear across the room, I'd go to the wall behind me, I'd bang my head against the wall, yelling and screaming at God, why me? I've been so good, and this is what you've done to me. I've been so good. And sometimes there'd be blood pouring out of my head and my roommate would run out. She'd say, she's at it again. And they'd come in and clean me up and calm me down and I'd be fine till the next day at one o'clock. Well, you know, I was too sick then and long before that time to hear God say, you don't have to be good. You don't have to be good. You are good. That's a given. No one has been deprived of that goodness. Well, where does the bad come in? Well, that's attitude, that's behavior. I separate that from the person. I separate that from this lady here. And I continue to chip away at my attitude and my behavior through that marvelous and wonderful process of recovery that we have. And I don't go it alone. I go with my brothers and sisters. You don't have to be good, you are good. What you do is not who you are. Whether you do the marvelous and the wonderful, or you do the terrible. I cannot help but be impressed at the goodness and holiness that sits and stands on these holy grounds here. Well, some 31 years later and for quite a while now, I have a why me question of God. Not why me, why am I an alcoholic, but why me God, why am I sober since most people don't receive this gift? It's a frequent question of mine. And my motive is I don't want to take the gift of sobriety for granted. I don't want my attitude to be, well, of course I'm sober. Big deal, sober 31 years, what else is new? So I do the why me? Why me, God, why am I sober? And he answers very loud and very clear. And he says pretty much the same thing all the time. He says, Maurice, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. The big book says, God did for him what he could not do for himself. And he says, many are called to the disease of alcoholism. Very few, a drop in the bucket, are chosen for the precious life-giving gift of sobriety. And I say, well, why me? And he says, make your little chart. I make a little chart. I headed alcoholism. I put a simple line down the center. I put on this side of the chart, all of us in recovery, round the world, fairly big number up there. And we put on this side of the chart, all those who are still out there. You wouldn't even see us. 
We're a minority group in society, people in recovery. I find it awesome to be on that side of the chart. And I don't want to take that for granted. Well, God, why me? Why am I on that side of the chart? And he says, well, Maurice, how do you see death? A hundred years ago now, that means a long time, I, I sat with death. I found it so negative, so terrible. How could God do this? And I had some readings and I was listening to some tapes. I was just meditating on death. And I read a line that I had read many times before. But this time I experienced a moment of amazing grace. And the line is, there's a time to be born, and there's a time to die. And I believe that's on God's calendar. And I believe any person goes to God in death when their work here on earth is finished. I can't believe God stands or sits any place and says, well, I'm going to take this one, and I'm not taking that one, and this one doesn't deserve to be. God doesn't operate that way. God wants top shelf the very best for each one of us. But your work is finished. I may have more work for that person to do, but on God's calendar, their work is finished. And the other thing that helps me is I'll see those people again when my work is finished. The point, untreated alcoholism, is still listed as an ultimate terminal condition, 100% fatal. And here we are. Well, I believe our death has been interrupted because our work's not finished. And ours is a specialized work. You know, there'll be tragedy in our world tonight. Some people will go to God, their work is finished. Others are saved, their work is not finished. More will be revealed to them. I believe our work is defined. It's to carry a message. It's to walk with. It's to pass it on. It's to be that fellowship. With all due respect to the church, the medical profession, other forms of help, they do a lot for us, but there's just something about one alcoholic sharing with another alcoholic. One member of Al-Anon sharing with another member of Al-Anon. The alcohol sharing, like happened at the gatehouse in Akron, Ohio, with Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob. And by that amazing grace of God as it operates in rooms like this, and my faithfulness to it, we know this program works. But if I'm not faithful to that, it's not going to work for me. And because of my faithfulness to that design for living, I haven't found it necessary to pick up a drink or any substitute since April 17th, 1971. I am not one who says I will never drink again. If I thought I would never drink again, perhaps I wouldn't be as faithful. Early this morning, I asked for daily bread. We'll see how tomorrow goes. So I came into the rooms and I did the old one too. I didn't drink and I went to meetings and I went to meetings and I didn't drink. And I could always be found sitting in the third row waiting for this thing to be finished, but they weren't going to say that I wasn't there. And one night I heard a fellow share, and this is what he said. He said he learned that unless he put the 12 suggested steps into his life and made some changes, he could very well lose his sobriety. And I sat up real tall because I was sure he was going to say, of course we don't mean that for the little sister there in the third <laughs> row. And the man never said it. <laughs> and with the help of my sponsor and a few other people, I learned why I was so miserable. Oh, I heard you say, change or die. But I used to poke the one next to me and say, isn't there something in between? <laughs> but you know, that's what it comes down to. 
if you're an alcoholic. You're always in motion. You're getting well or you're going back. You're changing or you're dying. There's no such thing as I'm stuck. I've stabilized. No such thing. We're always in motion. But no big deal about that. Because we have a marvelous and wonderful process to follow, beautiful men and women to walk with us as we do it. And all I have to do is I'll try. And as a result of getting into our 12 suggested steps, three changes started to happen and continue to happen right up into this moment. The first had to do with the intellect. See, when I came to you, my thinking went like this. Ready, fire, aim. I had postage stamp thinking. It was my way or no way. Now, we talked about that. You said, you know, put those 12 suggested steps into your life. It'll do wonders for your head. Now, I've had what I call an intellectual conversion up here. The picture is so bright and broad. I got off that postage stamp thinking. So I had an intellectual conversion, and it continues on a day-to-day -day basis. Then the moral conversion. My value system went out the window, and we talked about that. And you said, listen, follow the program. Don't go it alone. And you'll be able to put first things first and second things second. And when you're wrong, you'll be able to promptly admit it. And you'll be able to practice the principles in all your affairs. You'll be able to practice the principles and you won't have affairs. <laughs> so I've had a moral conversion. I have my value system back to them. And then the spiritual. That was the third one, which came to me, for me, in two ways. I heard you talking about this spirituality. And I would say to myself, well, I'm glad you have a little something like spirituality, but see, I have my religion. Do you know, for much of the first year, when I went to meetings, I had to go in the door sideways. I could not walk in like this because I had these flags in my ears. And the flags were waving. Catholic, Catholic, very, very Catholic. So I had to go in sideways. And, and we talked about that, and you said, you know, our program teaches us balance. And you helped me to get a center with my religion. I still have the same religion that I was brought up with. And you gave me a marvelous and wonderful technique to use. I take what helps me and I leave the rest. And then the spiritual. I said, well, give me a definition. And you said, well, it has to do with relationships. Oh, that was interesting. Relating to God. Oh, I wanted to get that squared away. Relating to other people. I said, oh, terrific. And then you said it also includes relating to self. And I said, I'll never have spirituality because there's nothing here to relate to. And you said to me, we'll help you get in touch. And thanks to you, I know today the full meaning of love your neighbor as yourself, not instead of yourself. I know the full meaning of this above all, to thine own self be true. And I believe the key to a life-giving, healthy, meaningful spirituality, which I talk a lot about, the key is relating to self. And no big deal about it. We have a marvelous and wonderful process of recovery that helps us to keep three things in place. A relationship with the higher power, a relationship with other folks, and a relationship with yourself. When God gives the gift of sobriety, and I believe it is given, he says three things. One, I'm interrupting your death. 
because your work's not finished. Carry a message, walk with, pass it on, be that fellowship. He says, second, you will share relationship with these people. They will come into your life and you will come into theirs. And third, he says, with this gift of sobriety, I give you your dignity. Walk tall. Through no virtue of ours, we have somehow been chosen, snatched back from a grave, from degradation, and clothed again in the robes of human dignity. May we never underrate or take for granted that gift of sobriety that is ours. And so my prayer for you is that you'll continue to have your sobriety, your recovery if you're in another program, your process for yourself. And as a result of that, I just know, I just know you'll have your dignity. And I close, the miracle still takes place, she does close. <laughs> I close with the short version of Maurice's story. I'm sure you can identify with it. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. And may God, however you understand that God, may God bless you and God bless me and God keep you and God keep me because nobody does it quite as well. Thank you so very much.